So I was walking on the peaceful and beautiful streets of Lidditz, and I had a friend who had, a, who had an Eagles shirt on, right? Nice big letters, E-A-G-L-E-S. And we're walking along, and suddenly this car slows down, rolls down its window, and somebody shouts out the window, Go Cowboys! And I, and I look over, and I thought, well, maybe it was one of you. Right? Maybe you guys were kind of, you know, teasing me. But no, it was just a, a random kind of young adult male who wanted to heckle us. But the thing is, is that as a Philadelphia Eagles fan, I'm used to that kind of treatment. I'm used to that kind of treatment because 45 years ago, 45 years ago this past weekend, there was somebody who was badly impersonating Santa at the Eagles stadium. And people decided to throw a snowball at him. And ever since then, Eagles fans have been labeled as the sort of the most terrible fans of all, and therefore any amount of booing, heckling, and agitating them is justified. And I say this part in jest, but, but also because this is what happens in our world. This is what happens in our world where there's some sort of wrongdoing sometime in the past, and it ends up justifying mistreatment and aggression and even violence. So right in the Middle East now, there was this mass kidnapping on October the 7th, and Hamas felt justified in that because Israel had been so aggressive in encroaching settlements and denying them sovereignty. And then Israel, in response, now feels justified in carpet bombing Gaza and so many people's houses. Again, this happens in life where because something happened in the past, in 2000, in 2017, in 1968, in 1945, in in the year 1040, in the year 450 B.C., in the year 1020 B.C., something happened and this justifies now our dislike, our enmity, our violence towards other people. And this can happen not simply in geopolitics. This can happen in our lives. Somebody at an office Christmas party or at a family gathering or at a practice for a school sports team or some uh, interaction with our neighbor. Somebody does something that we maybe don't understand but we, we don't appreciate and, and resentment takes root. And then maybe we do something in response and, and now both sides feel like the other person somehow started it and were justified. We have grounds for retaliation. We have grounds for disliking them, for seeking to undermine, if not even hurt them. And so the cycles of retribution and revenge take seed and become hardened hearts over not just a year, but over generations, in some cases centuries and even millennia. So what shall we do? How do we break these cycles of retribution? How do we break these cycles of vengeance and enmity and tension that boils over in unhelpful conflict? Well, today we heard from Luke's gospel, the father of John the Baptist, who now isn't just waxing poetically about his son, but he's, he's a prophet in this case. And, and he is declaring, he is declaring what, what not only his son John will do, but the way in which John will point to the Messiah, who we as Christians confess is Jesus. And Zechariah has these beautiful words that by the, the tender mercy from on high, the tender mercy of God that will come down from on high and it will bring about a new dawn, a new day that will, that will guide us and light our paths and enable us to walk in the ways of peace. And I think we, we hunger again for this. We hunger for a world in which we're, we're walking in the ways of peace, be it in our hearts, in our families, in our community, and indeed, in the, the world. But I think this insight here, this insight of, of Zechariah is that we can only walk in the ways of peace. We can only do that if there has been forgiveness of sins and there has been the inbreaking mercy of God. 
It's going to take mercy and forgiveness for us to break the cycles of hatred and retribution in our lives and in our world. And this really is what, what the cross is. The cross is, is God's mercy in breaking into human history, into the human story, over and against the hardness of our hearts. Again, God interrupts human history to, to bring forth and to share his love and his mercy with you and with all of the world. And last week I was reflecting on the cross, but I want to admit to you that I, I preached the truth Nothing but the truth, but I didn't quite get to the whole truth. And maybe there's no sermon that can ever get to the whole truth. But I talked about how the way of the cross, how the way of the cross was when we lived out mercy for those who are in need. And that this was what Jesus Christ had taught, and this is what Jesus Christ ultimately brought to fulfillment in the cross where he dies for you and for me and for this world. But that is only part of the way of the cross in terms of our living out mercy. The other way of the cross is is God's mercy for us and how God's mercy for us breaks into our lives and into our heart. And so I'd I'd like to invite us into some reflection on on how this this inbreaking of mercy into the world 2,000 years ago can break into our hearts and our lives today and how it might be that we might learn to walk in the way of peace. And to get at that, I want to address two challenges or really temptations that we will face as Christians in our efforts to walk in forgiveness into peace. And the first, the first temptation and the first challenge is that we will forgive people too quickly. Now, that sounds like a dumb thing for a pastor to say that we could err by forgiving people too quickly. But what, what happens is that in life is that sometimes we, we know we're supposed to forgive, and so we think, okay, I'm going to forgive. But we, we forget that, that we're humans and we're not God. And that it turns out that our kidneys and livers cannot process emotional and spiritual pain in 24-hour increments. Right, again, our kidneys and our liver cannot process spiritual and emotional pain in 24 increments. It's too much for us. I had a, a friend uh, once who, who fell in love, and uh, after a couple months, the girl unceremoniously dumped him, and he was heartbroken. And so he comes to me the next day, and he's clearly agitated, and he says, but you know, you know, Rob, I, I forgive her. And I looked at him, and I didn't say it out loud, but I said, no, you don't. <laughs> You're not even close. Because what had to happen was that the next three months, my my friend had to really discover the way in which he had been hurt, the way in which dreams he had weren't going to come to fruition. Also begin to accept the things that he had done wrong in the relationship. And then finally, for another three months after that, just to let that heal and that wound to to close up a bit. You see, the the way of the cross isn't that we simply can snap our fingers and suddenly we can forgive other people because God has forgiven us. It's really about a process, a a process of, of going to Jesus. And before the cross, finally letting go of our own sort of false narratives and justifications and finally confessing what we've done wrong. And it's about handing over that pain that pain that we have that we don't know what to do with and giving it to Jesus for in his body he can actually metabolize our pain and put it to something that is beautiful and life-giving. Indeed, there are times when the darkness seems long and we, we so want there to be resolution and reconciliation, but it turns out the other heart also needs to soften. And so we pray then for patience and long-suffering before the cross and the one who has wept for humanity for millennia to give us again strength to be patient as God's healing works itself out. The other way that, that we can face a challenge or even a temptation is, is that there are times, though, when, when the dawn of forgiveness and mercy has broken forth. God, God has brought about a new day. 
God has opened up doors for us, a, a serendipitous interaction with somebody that we hadn't had any connection with, and suddenly we're laughing or we're helping each other. Again, there can be those moments where, where the new day is dawning, but, but we're blind to it. I was given a great example this week by uh, Pastor Stuckey in Bible study, and it's of Winnie the Pooh. And at one point, Winnie the Pooh uh, is stuck, and he's stuck because he's holding on to a honeypot, and he won't let go of the honeypot. If he could let go of the honeypot, then he wouldn't be stuck. But the honeypot is so sweet, he doesn't want to let go of it. And I think resentment can be a lot like that. There's something sweet about resentment. Because when, when we're resentful, what this means is that we're justified in how we treat the other person. We can do whatever we want to them because they wronged us. And if we let go of that resentment, then suddenly we're accountable again for our actions. If we let go of our resentment, that means we have to be vulnerable again and we could get hurt by them one more time. And so we have to go to the cross and we have to see Christ so vulnerable there, stretched out, realizing that even though he dies, he comes back. And so we again can let our hearts love, knowing that Jesus will raise us up to new life. Again, to give over our resentment and hang it on Christ where it must go to die. There are times, though, when again the, the new dawn is breaking and God's mercy is interrupting our lives. And it's a beautiful and holy and precious thing. And the best thing we can do at that point, we can't create reconciliation, but when, when we start to sense that, like in the morning, when you just start to see the dawn, right, when we sense that that dawn is coming, that, that then we no longer simply pray, Savior of the nations, come, we pray, Lord, open up my eyes now. Open up my eyes to how you are coming and how your, your mercy has arrived in, in my life and in this world. A few years ago, my, my brother and I were really at odds, and, and I wasn't quite sure why, and so I, I wanted to, to bring about reconciliation, but I, it just it wasn't getting anywhere. It wasn't getting anywhere. But then I, I heard that there was this trip to Tanzania, and I didn't want to go alone. I wanted to go with somebody. So I asked my brother. I, I had a sense that, that there was, again, a, a calling to reconciliation. And so I, I asked my brother, I said, Tim, do you want to come, come to Tanzania with me? And he thought about it, and he said, yes, yes, I would. And so we, we went on this trip that was very demanding emotionally, spiritually, physically. But it was amazing the way in which it healed our relationship. And I'm so glad that we went together in the middle of our lives to kind of recalibrate our adult relationships one with one another. Again, we cannot bring about reconciliation on our own power. God has to open up a door, open up a window. Again, the, the mercy of God has to interrupt our lives and bring about this possibility. And so there are times in our life where we simply pray, we simply pray during those periods of conflict and estrangement and hardness of our own hearts or the hardness of others. We, we pray, Savior, Savior, Jesus of the nations, come. Come and soften my hearts, the hearts of me, my tribe, my community, my people, my nation. Soften the hearts of them, that person, that other tribe, that other nation. But then <laughs> there are times when, again, we just have this inkling that the dawn is about to come. The dawn of God's tender mercy breaking in, and then, and then we pray, Lord, open my eyes. Open my eyes that I may sense and see the inbreaking of your mercy, and then be guided and be guided in paths of peace for your namesake. Amen.